When we discuss about the society, we find that there is almost a consensus among the traditional historians and this is also supported by the recent historians as well that the South Indian society saw a very significant change. There was a disjuncture in the so social aspect which is manifested in different uh, aspects, different sides like rise of a new type of kingship. The Chakravarti model of kingship now takes place in polity. In society, we find the older society as manifested in the classical literature Particularly, we can uh, hear in uh, cite the sources like the Sangam texts. The society that was depicted in the Sangam texts, uh, there was a significant change when we come to the Pallava period or the Chalukyan uh, period. Then we find that uh, there was a growing uh, role of, very significant role of the uh, Brahmin establishments, the Agraharas, the Brahmadeyas, and they were playing a very significant role, particularly in the educational aspects as well as the religious aspects. Then we find in the religious field, rise of the Bhakti movement, the South Indian variant of Bhakti movement, particularly the Shaivite and the Vaishnavite uh, Bhakti and finally the rise of the temple institution. Temples become visibly large as well as their role also becomes multifarious, variegated, taking up large uh, areas of culture, for instance, uh, dance, art, architecture, even education and other parts of the social life of the local people where the temple was located, everything was being dominated, everything was being uh, controlled by the ritual aspects of the temple. So, in many senses, <coughs> it has been seen that the Pallava Chalukyan period from 600 to 900 AD can be uh, demonstrated as a period of a sharp structural change. But here we should come up with an alternate view as well that uh, rather than uh, talking about the disjuncture, the, the disjunctive feature of the South Indian society or polity, it was particularly a conjuncture, conjuncture in the sense that older elements remained which were then suited to the new challenges that were coming up in this period. When we are talking about the society, we find that in the uh, classical texts, in the Sangam texts, already there was a uh, notion, there was a knowledge of the North Indian, particularly the Sanskritic elements. Uh, 
the brahmins were known the uh, north indian uh, gods do not very prominent but they were known they were alluded to and uh, the whole society was distributed the whole uh, social uh, the temporal uh, space uh, was the spatial uh, space was uh, divided into five types eco types we can say the tinai concept and there we find that the whole society whole region particularly the tamil speaking region from which we get the sangam text was divided into five tinais that is one kurinji the hill space uh, or eco type then mullai the pastoral uh, region the grassland region then we have palai the desert land though we very well know that there was no uh, desert in uh, tamil nadu but it is said that if there was a consecutive rainfall failure in the kurinji and mullai region the landscape partook the shape of a desert uh, which is very true even today also then we have the marudam region that is the well watered well irrigated agricultural space particularly in the riverine zone and here we can allude to either the kaveri or the vaihai delta region in the deeper south and finally we have the littoral space that is the nadal region dominated by the uh, traders as well as the fishermen or the boatmen now among this five fold divisions there was no ritual or hierarchization and ascription of a ritual purity what is it there was no distinction between say the ulavars the peasants that is uh, who were residing in the uh, marudam region and the maravars who were a uh, kind of fierce uh, people residing in the palai region in the later period which is also part of the uh, later uh, classical texts in say silapadigaram we find that slowly emergence of a uh, hierarchization was setting in that is it is said that the ulavars of marudam region and here the name names are given the vellalars and the karalars they will take or their position in the society will be much higher than the pastoral herdsmen or other people so slowly even before the onset of the pallava chalukya period we find that slowly the peasant life based in the riverine delta zones was becoming more and more predominant but here as we are talking about conjuncture we will see that there was no doubt a change in the pallava um, chalukya period that is the peasant life which was there earlier confined in a particular tinai that is marudam particularly in the riverine delta zones slowly this peasant life was proliferated in the erstwhile forest or the mountain regions with the help of the tank irrigation here the pallava uh, period is very very important we should remember about the important inscriptions like that we find in the chingalpet district uttarameerur uh, site where the large vairamegha talag that is a very large tank was used for 
irrigation purpose and through this irrigational activities agriculture was then expanding in the hitherto non peasant regions or areas is a period in south india which is known as the kalabhra interregnum which falls in between the classical period that is the period dominated by the three crowned kings the muvendan the cholas pandyans and the cheras fighting with the smaller chieftains kurunilamannar and the rise of the pallava and the resurgent pandyans there is a very significant historical gap between these two features or phenomena which is generally known in the historical lit literature as the kalabhra interregnum a mysterious people supporting the heretical sects posed a very serious challenge for the peasant people and the peasant way of life so historians like barton stein say that in the subsequent period with the rise of the warrior control of the pallavas which saw the end of the kalabhra interregnum or the kalabhra challenge the challenge of a uh, non peasant people on the peasant way of life and the resurgent pandyas saw the end of this kalabhra rule and this period the rise of the pallavas rise of the resurgent pandyans was affected because of this peasant brahmin alliance which was beneficial for all the three components of this alliance namely one the king the ruling family here the pallavas and the pandyans two the peasants and the brahmins as well how this alliance helped all the three the kings or the ruling families they were helped by the brahmins who helped them ideologically as well as there are some instances like uh, <clears throat> when there was a um, confusion in the succession in the uh, pallava family after the death of parameshwara parameshwara varman the second we find a group of brahmins was part of a delegation who waited upon hiranyavarman for choosing a skion of to this vacant throne so the brahmins were playing a very significant role in polity as well and the brahmins they benefited from the proliferation of the peasantry proliferation of uh, wet cultivation based on tank irrigation because they depended on the surplus which was then being generated by the proliferation of wet wet cultivation and for the peasants who were shell shocked by the 
uh, challenge posed by the non peasant people here epitomized by the Kalabra interregnum they found the Brahmin support to be helpful for a cohesive ideological factor. There was the role of the woman also very, very important, particularly in the uh, Bhatapi Chalukya dynasty as well as the Pallavas also. We find role of the royal family members, the woman of the royal family, uh, family playing significant role in the endowment of the religious institutions. Rangapataka, who was the favorite queen of Nandivarman, helped in his uh, construction of a small shrine which is situated within the precincts of the Vaikuntha Perumal temple in Kanji. Same thing we find in the uh, uh, Vatapi Chalukya dynasty as well, where they were not only supporting the Hindu religious institutions, but they were also supporting construction of the uh, heretical sect temples or religious institutions, particularly the Jains, where Kumkuma Devi helped in the construction of a Jain temple. Then you have the courtly life, which is also a very important part because whatever inf informations we get, it is basically or the lion's share comes from the royal dynasty itself. The palace institution becomes very, very important in this period and the pomp, grandeur of the royal uh, family or the courtly life becomes more and more predominant or prominent in the later Pallava period. The, uh, the palace institution becomes more and more uh, prominent, more and more elaborate. And there we find many women either bought from the foreign land or captured from the wars playing a significant role either as the dancers, sometimes concubines, sometimes the functionaries of the, of the um, royal establishment. Some of them enjoyed significant honor as well from the Chalukyan um, information, Chalukyan inscriptions, we find one Bina Portigal, the um, honorific Portigal itself shows that she is highly honored, a concubine of a Chalukya uh, king, uh, in fact instituting a very important religious function that is Hiranyagarbha. It shows that the ruling uh, family, particularly the royal family members, women, as well as the members of the uh, palace institution playing a significant role. What are the memorial stones? It is basically the commemorative stone raised in the memory of the fallen heroes who has fallen 
while fighting war or even during the time of natural death as well. Earlier during the uh, uh, earlier in South Indian history, we have seen the memorial stones being raised even for those who have died a very natural death, the Chaya Stambhas of Nagarjuni Konda. Later, in the Pallava period, we find proliferation of memorial stones, particularly in the memory of those who have uh, faced, who have encountered a heroic death proliferating particularly in the North Arcot, South Arcot districts of the northern part of present Tamil Nadu. Many uh, memorial stones are there, not only in Tamil Nadu, but also in uh, Karnataka as well as Maharashtra as um, along with Andhra Pradesh, the whole of South India, particularly the middle part which was dominated by the pastoral non-peasant people, there we encounter this raising of the memorial stones which is known as the Virakkal. Uh, this uh, memorial stones give us lot much of social informations. Along with this, we find the rise of educational institutions, very, very important educational institutions were there. Educational institutions are, in those days, in the medieval period, dominated by the religious institutions and in South India, we find proliferation of three types of educational institutions, the Hindu educational institutions, the Buddhist as well as the Jain educational institutions attached to, particularly for the last two that is the Buddhist and the Jains, monasteries or the monastic educational institutions become important. In this period we find slowly the Hindu institutions on the wake of the rise of the Bhakti movement becoming more and more important, overshadowing the Buddhist and the Jain uh, educational institutions. Ghatika becomes important. There are differences of opinion regarding the meaning of Ghatika. One group uh, holds that it, it, it is derived from the word Ghata, which means concentrating on some aspect here, education. Another group interprets Ghatika as derived from the Itimon, derived from Goshti, that is, it is a group of people involved in education. Whatever may be the etymological origin, Ghatika becomes very important educational institutions which had a long history. Then, uh, comes the curricula. What was the type of curricula? Here we find that either it was the Chaturdasa Vidya, that is four Vedas, six Vedangas, then there was the Nyaya, Puran, etc., or Ashtadasha Vidya, which includes Ayurved, Dhanurved, then uh, musical instructions as well. Then we have the Buddhist and the Jain foundations as well. Hyuen Sang, who visited South India around 642 AD, sh shows that there were 
several numerous Buddhist institutions, but most of them were deserted. It shows that Buddhism was in decline in this period, but he also refers to the prosperous conditions of the Jain institutions in this period when he visited South India. For the Jains, Pataliputra, that is presently situated in Kuddalore, was a very famous uh, educational institution where Maninikir, later known as Appar, took his uh, initiation and became a Jain. So, all this shows that the society in its different aspects was facing a kind of conjuncture, if not disjuncture, older way of life was being suitably changed and uh, adjustments were being done to suit or to address the new challenges that were coming up in this period.